Former Noel, what was your uh, what was your major when you were here? I was an economics major uh, first and foremost. It was my primary major. Um, when I realized that I was about to leave school early because I had dual enrolled in high school, I all of a sudden realized I needed to find sport management just to extend the amount of time that I was here. So sport management it was, but uh, econ through and through mostly. Um, I'm grateful to the sport management uh, school obviously for really getting me to where I am now. Um, and it was obviously something that kind of piqued the interest of EA um, that I believe really got me the job. Um, to be honest, like the, the job senior QB analyst uh, is a heavy, it's heavy into the data, um, heavy into really actionable data. So having some, a background in economics and having a background in sports uh, was advantageous and really helped uh, in kind of landing that job. Uh, I'm actually stumped. What does QV stand for? Quality verification. So typically the first thing people hear or think of when they hear quality verification is, oh, you test video games, you play video games. So get a lot of grandma boys res references. <laughs> if anybody understands that, they, um, but, and that, that is part of the job, playing it. Um, I mean, wouldn't any software uh, tester or software analyst understand like the product that they're, that they're uh, working on. Um, so there is, to a degree, um, testing the game but most of the work is spent kind of designing end-to-end -end quality. Um, so new feature work, uh, understanding how live services impact us, uh, and basically working on, on the data of the game, the telemetry that we receive from our users. And we'll come back to that, but I want to talk more about EA, because I don't remember seeing them at Seminole Futures or STEM. I mean, how did, they, how did you find them or how did they find you? That's where the economics came in. So my recruiter who originally had gotten in touch with me was an economics uh, major herself at Texas Tech. Um, and I don't know how quite to explain it, but between economics uh, majors and people who understand uh, economics, uh, there's kind of this camaraderie, like the way, the way you think, the way you can understand each other objectively. Um, so that was kind of my foot in the door, really. Um, it piqued her interest. She saw sport management, which is something that they desire as well, because if we're being honest, a lot of computer science um, and a lot of software engineers don't have as great a grasp on sports <laughs> as, as they'd like to believe or as many of us would like to believe. Um, so the idea is, they, the reality is they need people who understand football, who understand the rules, who understand uh, the semantics of the game um, to really help help run, uh, run things. Which game, which game platform are you on? I currently work on Madden. Um, they have a few uh, games that they work on and they develop at Tiburon, which is the studio in Orlando. Um, but Madden is far and away the biggest one there. Uh, so, but I, I'd work on Madden and I work on a few different pods um, over the years. I've worked on a few different, um, currently I'm focusing mainly on commentary. Uh, the commentary and the audio aspect of it, um, but I've worked on the user interface before and I've worked on um, animations, uh, graphics, a uh, little bit of gameplay here and there. So kind of uh, diversity and the ability to uh, understand just the game in general from not just the end user aspect, but the different pods and different teams is, is beneficial as well. It's it. So when you say the announcing, the announcing that happens within Madden. Right, right? so uh, commentary is, there's a lot of the audio in general, but commentary is probably 80% of the work. Um, most of it is dependent on gameplay data that is triggered. So for instance, say I'm running an I-form and I run an H-back dive into the A-gap and I gain five yards all of that information is going into the commentary system or into our context system, which uh, is basically the triggering system for uh, the commentary. Uh, so the reality is they need somebody who understands football from a really, from a semantic point of view to where you understand the rules, you understand all sorts of things uh, about how it functions. Um, and then you can also go into the code uh, to understand what's triggering, what parameters aren't functioning, what conditions aren't uh, working as expected, and then bring that up with the engineers, the producers, the team members, and 
finding out what, uh, what ways to best fix that. So. so you'll gather feedback and talk to engineers and explain what you saw maybe as bugs or right. issues? Right, that, that's, that's uh, a large portion of the job. Um, I like to think that we, we do a lot of work similar to a producer in the sense that we, um, we bring teams together, we uh, help keep teams on schedule, we help keep them uh, aware of risks on projects. Uh, we help keep them aware of um, any bugs that they've entered in knowingly or unknowingly, um, and basically to help them push out as quality a build as possible um, as, uh, in order to get the game shipped on time, essentially. What's been the most exciting aspect of working for EA at this point in your career? I would say the working kind of just in a sports environment. Um, I'm not a huge gamer by nature, uh, and that was kind of the thing when I got hired out of, out of school. Uh, I hadn't played video games in probably a few years, mainly because of you know, college kid problems, just not having a TV, expenses, <laughs> things like that. Um, but the reality is they, they needed me, they wanted me because of the data skills, because of understanding how uh, data impacts us and um, know, un, knowing and understanding sports. Um, but the most exciting really is just, yeah, like working within sports, understanding that just about everybody you work with, aside from most of the engineers, uh, are huge football fans and really love producing and developing games. And it's a very passionate environment, no doubt. So let's talk about a little bit more about your role. Describe some of the data that you gather and what you do with your data. Right, uh, so most of it is user telemetry, which uh, the best way I can explain telemetry is um, kind of with that, that I form run five yards example. Uh, everything that the user does in game um, essentially has a hook, something that is triggered by something that they do. Um, so if I am, say, on the front, front end menu and I go from one tab to the other tab, that's a hook, essentially telling us that the user went from here to point A to point B. Um, and alternatively, in different modes like franchise or in our ultimate team mode, um, everything that the user does can be tracked. Uh, so pulling that data tells us kind of about the consumer habits and the way they view and understand your product, uh, which is really the data that is most interesting and most valuable to a company, really. Um, they need to know kind of what, what people are doing once they get in game once they are, how they interact with your user interface, how they interact with. And you're talking about how the users interact. Yes, as, so like in a retail environment. Um, so essentially they, they would get all of the information that they need from day one. Once you release the game and say 100,000 people are playing, you understand how 100,000 people are interacting with the product that you designed. So and now maybe you can help me, I don't know if we're close to this, but we talked about life services. Does this lead us into that engagement? Explain what life services is. And so life services are an incredibly important um, thing for EA. They've, it's been an incredible, like, huge push for them lately. Um, you might know it really as Ultimate Team. So if you've heard of FUT, FIFA Ultimate Team, or MUT, Madden Ultimate Team, those essentially are live services where Throughout the year, they continually update with content to keep users engaged and to keep them coming back to the game, right? So there are ads, but they don't exist as predominantly as, say, something like Facebook or YouTube. So the way they measure engagement, or the way they measure, if you will, profit, is by how engaged their consumers are. Um, so if we have somebody who is logging on twice weekly, three times weekly, that's pretty high engagement. We want them to be on pretty consistently and we want them to uh, play the game for a while. Uh, that doesn't mean they need to spend money all the time, but it does mean that they need to continually interact with Madden or continually interact with FIFA. And that's essentially how, how they do that. There's metrics such as like weekly active users, monthly active users, daily active users, DAU, um, that they measure that by. Um, so as long as those marks, they're, they're obviously going to go down after launch, but as long as those marks 
essentially year over year have go in the green, then things are starting to look good. Um, and things have looked good for Madden pretty recently. Yeah, so how far back, that's interesting, because I know Madden as a gaming franchise goes back a long time through. Yeah. So for this data that you're looking at, how far back do you look, how many years? So I can't speak really to how, how much they utilize. Engine, things change uh, the way, like the engine changes, um, all kinds of, the telemetry hooks change, tech changes in general. So there could be tech limitations as far as that. Uh, I couldn't say what exactly, how many years, but typically three to four years is, is a time range that they look at um, in order to kind of get historical value from. Um, and really, live services have been a part of EA for five plus years now, but they've really taken off within the past two to three years. So looking at data from the past two to three years uh, is really the most important at this point. And then obviously, into the future. Who, and this will lead to the next question, and maybe you talk about it in terms of who looks at that life services engagement data, but what types of people do you collaborate with at EA? So I work with uh, producers, I work with uh, developers. Developers could be software engineers, people who are making code changes. Uh, there could be audio artists, people who are designing uh, the way the audio interacts and sounds, uh, people, animators, people who uh, design player locomotion. Uh, basically, working in QV allows you to kind of combine all those specialties, look, uh, interact with a bunch of different people, essentially, and uh, kind of bring the team together in a way that helps kind of keep the project on track and keep projections in track with what they, what they should be. So it, here we are on the afternoon Monday. I know you, you're up here with us. You're not with your team. What meetings did you have to shift around? What, does, what would a Monday look like for you if you weren't here today? So it depends. Um, right now, the stage of the uh, project phase that we're in is uh, our last sprint. So it's the last bit of production that we're, we're doing. So it's probably the calm before the storm, I could say. Yeah. There's a good bit of meetings going on. Teams are aligning with what they do. Um, before pre-alpha starts. Uh, once pre-alpha starts, pre-alpha is essentially the, the phase before alpha where all of your sprint work uh, throughout the past five, six months it kind of uh, amalgamates and comes together um, and people get ready for, for the crunch that alpha brings, which is heavy bug numbers. Um, all, the features, all the new feature work is in on pre-alpha and it allows uh, QV and the rest of the production team to kind of analyze what they've done, the work they've done over the past five to six months, and then improve on it. So I'm just curious, and when I hear pre-alpha, I personally, as an MIS, right. and, uh, excited about that. So econ and sports management. So did, did EA tra uh, train you on agile sprints? You know, how, what did that look like? Yeah, so we currently, EA uses uh, Scrum right okay. now, um, kind of a, bit of a interesting, I guess you would call it maybe Scrum, scrum Kanban, yes. kind of, uh, to a degree. Um, but they needed an agile environment, especially with live services, because live services, obviously, since they're live, they require you to like update your product and uh, develop your product within a short time frame. So Scrum provides that ability, as opposed to something like Waterfall, which is, I guess you could say, a little bit more rigid. Yep. Um, many other gaming companies, if you, if you think of like a game like Call of Duty, uh, the production process for that is gonna take probably close to two to three years. Scrum wouldn't work as well, or could potentially work, but Waterfall would be a better example of that. Um, so with an iterative title like Madden, uh, where we release it yearly, uh, Scrum gives us the ability to kind of break it into pieces, month by month, sprint by sprint, yeah. um, process by process, uh, to kind of better pull that, those data and that, that data and that analytics um, and with in the project. And with software like Madden, because you're building on source code, base code, yeah. for, you can, go, it's really about that next iteration, that next, right? It's, right. Okay. And that, that, that's kind of what gives us the ability to, that's why data is so important, because especially this year over year stuff, because it gives us, all right, well, where were we this time last year in the month, this month in the project? Were we ahead of schedule, were we behind schedule? Um, 
how many bugs did we have, what were the projections looking like, was the project on track uh, to meet these goals, these gates, um, these specific milestones that we had previously set. Um, and it gives kind of leadership an idea of you know, when to uh, put things into high gear, when to settle down and say, all right, we're, we're floating along now, we can, we can cruise into alpha and then yeah. begin work. Um, I'm very thankful they let you come today. So tell yeah. me, how are you measured personally? I'm sorry? How are you measured personally? You talk about leadership and here you, so how do you get measured in your job? Um, I'd say the quality of the work that you bring. So especially in, in QV, um, everybody has opinions, uh, especially our users. <laughs> Video games can be a hot topic for many people. Um, and the same can be said of people who work on them and develop them. Uh, opinions are very opinionated. Um, so. The reality is they need something that's what they call actionable, actionable evidence or actionable data um, to, instead of saying this feature doesn't look, this feature isn't fun or this feature doesn't look good, you need to bring something actionable that says this is why it isn't good. I think it's not good because the speed of the players is a lot slower than it was last year and the user interface is clunky and doesn't make much sense. That's something that's actionable that the developers can kind of work on and improve with, improve upon, essentially. Um, so everything that we do is based, and everything that we're measured on is based on how much actionable uh, information we can provide. When you were starting out in this environment, coming out of Florida State, what, did you have any challenges pushing yourself to have those point of views to be critical in a, in right. a way that could be heard? Yeah, I mean, most certainly. Um, coming out of FSU, again, I didn't have a computer science background. Uh, I'd say about 70%, 80% of the people there at EA have some kind of computer background, computer science background, where they understand the basics of coding. I had absolutely really not much of a clue um, how C++ worked, C Sharp, Python, what have you, uh, how it functioned and how it really uh, benefited us in our daily work. Uh, so that was kind of something that I had to just kind of pick up on and learn, and it's not something that's required by us uh, to work in every day. Everybody has like a specialty that, uh, and dependencies uh, that they can work with. So if I'm working with a software engineer, I expect him to be a subject matter expert in what he's doing. So that means I can, I can work in my job, work on the same feature that he's working on, and expect that he, he knows what he's doing in C++. So it's not something I wouldn't be necessarily scared of if I wanted to enter an industry like this, not knowing how to code, because it's obviously a skill, I think an enormous skill. Uh, and if you do, more power to you. It's, it's something that is definitely gonna benefit you in the future. Um, but working with people who know what they're doing and are subject matter experts um, that you can depend on uh, to ask questions, basically high level questions of how's this going to affect me and my pod, my, me and my team, and then I'll, uh, conversely, how's this going to affect you and your pod and your team? And a so, pod is a team at EA? Yes. I love being a part of a pod, I think that sounds cool. So I know we right. talked about in the prep aut the role of automation. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me about you know, automation, what is it to you? How, do you, got, how do you use it? So especially with uh, our commentary system, we have close to 15,000 contexts and counting uh, in game currently. And the reality is most of those, probably the majority of them, are low level or low level priority contexts that are only gonna happen if say, you do something that's really like a 1% chance of occurring in game. So the reality is you need somebody other than a tester that's been outsourced somewhere, um, or you need something to kind of trigger that context on a consistent basis and then prove that it's working in a automated environment. So we have, EA has bots that they use, um, and it works for like all of our gameplay features, so animations are tagged. Uh, franchise uh, has scripts that run specifically for what they need, and then commentary obviously has scripts that uh, are designed for something specific like post-play, something yeah. specific like mid-play, uh, TD analysis, or things that if I was testing manually would take me perhaps hours. So the reality is it's just something 
that saves us a massive amount of time and uh, essentially makes the entire team more efficient. Which frees up time to do other things to make right. increased quality, which is kind of neat that you can not be threatened by that. Because I know some people in the business work are threatened by automation. You right. welcome it. Yeah, exactly. So most of, most of what we do, since it is considered testing, they want us to get away from that. They want us to get away from testing in, in like extremely uh, manually in order to free us up to do higher level things and find higher level bugs and find higher level issues in the code essentially um, that an automated bot would not be able to pick up. Um, a bot might show us that there's a bug, but it's not gonna tell us why there's a bug. So that's essentially our job is to kind of like go into the, into the code and find out what parameters and conditions are off and then bring that up with our developers to get fixed. That's, that's says a lot about the culture of EA too. I think that's mm -hmm. fantastic. What about machine learning? What, what opportunities um, do you see that we apply machine learning in your role? So I personally uh, wouldn't, don't use like machine learning that much, but I do know people and that there's projects that are active now. Projects that um, without saying too much uh, would require randomization uh, as opposed to if you will, like a crowd being synchronous and everything looking similar. Uh, machine learning, I know, kind of helps with randomizing uh, certain events to kind of determine how far away an object needs to be in order for a human not to recognize it. So if <coughs> these two characters are doing the same thing, you're not gonna pick up on it. Right. As long as they're not this close, as opposed to something like that close. Right. So it, it picks up on like human visual cues uh, things that aren't readily available, like we don't readily pick up on. Um, but I don't use it actively um, in, in the sense. But of, you hear of, about it with yeah. the people you collaborate yeah, with. Yeah, it's, it. it's, a, it's a huge part of just the company in general. It's something that they're pushing for. How do you know overall if you have a happy customer, happy consumer? Is it just in the sales of the, the game or? Um, our executive producers may like to think that. Yeah. Um, Sales are, are an important part of that, um, but they do have scores, like net promoter score, or the weekly active, active user counts, monthly active, weekly active, daily active. Um, if more people are playing your game, it's probably safe to assume that the game is probably succeeding uh, in the eyes of the public. So if I have a 10%, 15% year over year increase in the amount of MUT users, some people might not like the, the feature, but it gives us actionable data on, yes, it's becoming more popular. Um, it's something that our consumers like. Uh, the net promoter score uh, kind of details how successful they are in executing um, the user sentiment, essentially. So basically how happy are our customers and is what we're doing successful, essentially. Uh, and that kind of gives them the answers to the high level questions that they're asking um, and allows them to uh, build two year plans, three year plans that in the end uh, will help Madden grow as a franchise. That's in, in extending that. So here in your role, trying to connect with your customer, you're in there not necessarily testing, they're trying to get you to be more about that experience. So mm. do you find yourself, are you, do you give ideas for features based on what you see in the game? Yeah, they're, they're very open to feedback, especially from the people who work on it. Um, the, the idea is they want, again, that actionable feedback that will make improve it. But when you do come with that actionable feedback, coming at them with data is easily the most important uh, facet of that because they want to see, all right, well, if you think this feature would be that much uh, that much better for our users. Uh, take an example that we have now that was successful, find the data for it that proves that it's successful, proves that uh, it will be popular with the users, and then combine that into your ask, essentially, your, your recommendation. Uh, so that actionable feedback is, is really the key to everything. Is there any, I, we, we, you alluded to there's some things I don't want, you know, I don't want you to slip and talk about anything you're not allowed to talk about, but what are some of the innovative stats or features that you're, that you're at liberty to share with us? So I think one of the more interesting things that we have now is our project uh, management. So 
we have rec as recently as last year kind of implemented a new way of tracking um, kind of the time that developers, producers, anybody who works in the building spends their time so that they can more efficiently uh, deliver on the asks and the requests that they've, um, they've gotten from their team members. So the project management, uh, we, we use something called JIRA, um, but it provides us uh, large amounts of data that um, proves how successful a, a project is and where it's headed, essentially. So that, that's, that's just one example of something that's uh, really interesting and that will definitely be used in the industry more and more. Awesome, I have one more question and then we're gonna open it up for the, um, for the audience to ask some questions. And to speak to those um, maybe that are thinking about, I, I, wanna, I, I wanna follow Matt's plan, I, want, I wish EA Sport was at Seminole mm -hmm. Futures. How, you know, what wisdom do you have for somebody that wants to get in that lane or just in general for their career? Well, I just recently heard uh, that they're going to be, there's going to be some recruiters at Technol or okay. one of the, I'm not, not entirely sure of that. I just, the first time I heard about it. So I guess that's in a few days. Could be something to potentially look into. Um, but the reality is that they, depending on the job that you apply for, like, I mean, if you apply as a software engineer, the expectation is that you know, you have a background in computer science and you know what you're doing as far as code. Um, code work goes, um, but they also are very open with who they hire. It's not this rigid system of like they got to have requirement A, B, and C in order to get hired. Uh, they're more, more and more Musk-like, where he's saying he's hired, he likes to hire high schoolers, uh, people with high school degrees and not even college degrees. Wow. Um, so the the idea is to ha have, depending on what your responsibilities will be. Um, having a great grasp on really sports in general and then um, showing them and proving to them that you're a quick learner and finding out <coughs> that whatever it is you can do for them, you can do better and better and better month in and month out. That's Continual awesome. improvement. Awesome. I love that. All right. So for the crowd, what do we have? What questions do we have? Yes, back here. Interesting. Um, so we're currently working, and I can talk about this since it's pretty much everybody knows that it's, it's happening. Uh, Gen 5 consoles are coming out. So PlayStation 5, um, Xbox, I don't know what they're calling it. Uh, yeah. But those are coming out, and essentially those are as powerful as some of the most powerful P uh, PCs we have now as far as graphics go. So the idea is load times are gonna be zero, um, next to zero. Um, and it'll allow our engine to improve on things that it didn't before. The performance aspect, uh, that the pipeline that it will opens up enormously. Um, so it allows new features that weren't technically possible in previous generations to all of a sudden come to the forefront. Um, as to what specifically, uh, will be the next, it probably will be, it, it, this is my personal uh, thought, it probably will be some form of machine learning or some form of like intelligent um, animation or reactionary type tech. Um, something similar to motion capture but with uh, greater feedback and more um, instant kind of reaction that AI could possibly bring as opposed to an animation that's triggered to occur when X happens. So possibilities of X times 100, and the AI takes that and chooses which of those is the most probable and which would fit the scenario best. So that's another scenario where AI and machine learning can that's awesome. improve. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that's really neat. We had a question over here, I think. Yes, sir? Yeah, esports are enormous. Um, so I recently read that it's going to be somewhere shy of two billion dollars of a market and by 2022. So you can definitely best believe that EA is trying to capitalize on something like that. Um, they recently we've had something called our Madden Classic tournament, uh, which uh, brings together some of the best gamers, um, some of the best Madden players um, in the world, 
and allows them to compete in order to win prizes. Uh, that prize pool has grown steadily year over year. Um, I couldn't say specifically what at the university level they're doing, but there is definitely an investment in the youth aspect of it. They like having younger users. They like having users that um, can pick up on the game where accessibility is not challenging right off the bat, where you can pick it up, learn it, and then play with somebody who's been playing for five years. So the idea is to get more and more users interested in the sport through eSports. And as you get more and more users involved, you get more and more data. Right. So one more, and then we'll, go, we'll keep going to the audience, but who mines the data in your company? Is that internal, external? It's internally. Uh, we have two different types of data analysts, I guess you could say. Uh, one that works specifically under the quality verification core team, which is the, the department that I work in. And there's another that, um, if you will, the corporate, uh, corporate studio type analysts. And they are the ones who are mining the data that's like real deep in the system. Uh, the weekly active, monthly active user counts, the engagement surveys, the, or the engagement results, and things like that. Um, the data analysts for the quality verification department essentially are pulling together project analytics that give us a better idea. Of it's what, a project analytics? Yes. Really, okay. That, that gives us a better idea of like where the project's headed. So like high value targets. Yeah. Um, amount of you know, bugs that have been entered this week compared to last week, you know, various things like that. So while you're using sprints for your software development, is there a different analytics uh, framework that they use? Do you, do you happen to know, have any insights into that? Um, no, they, a lot of it is year over year. So they kind of just look into the data from last year, determine you know, how many features were at. So if the sprint work for this audio artist is to uh, put in this brand spanking new feature and we anticipate you know, 20 bugs around that, then the idea is we want to go back into the year before, find a scenario that's somewhat similar. You're probably not going to find a apples, apples to apples comparison, but find something where the scope of the feature is similar, find out the bug projections of that, and then see, comparatively speaking, you know, how risky is it? Where, where is it going from here? Um, to kind of compare it. Gotcha. All right, what about questions over here? Any hands up over here? In the back over there. <laughs> Ooh! Yeah, I wow! Knew it was coming. Uh, I'm surprised you get that really, question. <laughs> no comment. That's that's really all I can say. <laughs> I know I know you guys want more, but I don't want more. But yeah, I want to know too. I'm glad you asked it. Yes. Um, on the personalization of games, what does EA Sports do to you know really engage the user in a different way or on a more personal level than you know just a more broad based game to game good at? Right, so I think that, that could be something like our live services, so like something like Mutt. Um, the idea is they want to bring a, a value to that service that the user finds valuable. Um, and kind of come out with content as the year goes by that they find increasingly value. So, you know, the game comes out and then say like a month later, we release a batch of content that there's value in, inherent. Maybe there isn't as much value for it as the next release, but the idea is that continually you want to increase the amount of value to your users month after month after month after month in order to keep them engaged in playing. Uh, the chaff rate or the rate at which like, our users basically quit after opening, turning the game on, playing the game, how many hours they play. Uh, the lower that is, the worse off essentially we're doing our jobs. We want people to keep playing for the longest possible, and the best way to do that is through inherent value. Great question. Was there any other hands up? What other questions do we have? Yes. Over here. Yes. Player stats. Okay, yeah, that's that's an enormous part of the game itself. Uh, players each and every year hit up Twitter and hit up our guy who's the rating analyst uh, constantly. So it, it plays an enormous part of the formula that 
kind of derives like how skillful uh, the player, how, how much, how successful things are going to be in the game for you. So, for instance, if I I have a player with, and usually things are one to one. So if I have a player with high block shed, that's going to be uh, specifically compared to a player who has like high uh, pass block or high um, block in general or whatever. So the idea is you want the formula to kind of be um, balanced because if things on players, and this is this is for the ultimate team, but in game for the ratings that come out yearly, it's just kind of what they believe. It's almost it's a little subjective, but it's essentially how they how they think the player is going to perform uh, throughout the year. Um, with the ultimate team, it can improve throughout the year, um, but the idea is to keep it balanced uh, to keep players who are not as skilled from just picking it up and quitting because they play a skilled player and they play a team that's rated you know five better than them. So the idea is they want something that's accurate uh, as far as like statistics and as far as like the, the ratings of the players, but they don't want overpowered. They want that perfect medium balance, really. Any other questions? Yes. Mm. You mentioned that your examples were kind of with matters. How do you see um, kind of like a segmentation and working strategy um, kind of in terms of you know, obviously you're going to have you know, people that matter and then you kind of sell your product and you're going to be segmented. And how do you see the diversified kind of talent portfolio uh, within the kind of society that you're going to be? Yeah, so I mean, we, we work with the, the team members um, from different franchises quite a bit, probably more than what you'd imagine. Uh, so we understand kind of their product in general. We, we obviously are all gamers there too. So we play the games that they produce and develop. Uh, so we have a kind of a good idea of the general direction that things are headed. Um, the idea is if EA has this, this thing, this initiative that they call one team, one mindset, and they want people to be completely comfortable with reaching out to their peer that works on a completely different franchise, and it's probably across the world, somewhere in Sweden, somewhere in Vancouver, LA, doesn't really matter, but the, the flow and transfer of information, they want that to be as seamless as possible. So if you have a question that is specific to the Frostbite engine, and you don't know how it's gonna implement correctly, um, but FIFA did that feature last year. They want you to reach out. They want you to understand, like, to work together, essentially, in order to, to find out how best it will work for Madden. Maybe it won't work for Madden as well. Maybe there's, there's things that, that aren't as optimal. But the idea is they want people to communicate with each other. And, and whether that's the UFC team, whether that's a sports team, it might not even be a sports team. It could be a Star Wars team. It could be the... Battlefield team, um, anything that will provide value, and we're all, since we're all one team, uh, anything that will help create the greatest quality product for Madden, for Battlefield, for EA. We have time for one more question. Yes. Yeah, so they definitely do. They have a team of data analysts that are specifically, uh, I, I have an acquaintance that I know who does it. Um, I couldn't say much specifically about how they do it, like the specifics of you know what they do, their day-to-day -day job, but I do know that they're very committed to it. Uh, it's something that they realize, um, you know, anytime you, you come out with a product or a service and there's an in-game economy, there's always going to be people that try and sneak around. There's always going to be people that try and essentially a black market economy will, will, will pop up. Um, so farmed accounts, uh, accounts where people abuse the rules, they do their best to kind of track that and ban the account, essentially. So it's, it's something, it's an issue that's obviously ever present. And there are teams that are completely dedicated towards uh, eradicating that kind of thing. So the question that was around just several had to do with uh, just 
how do we ha handle hackers and people that are trying to get access? That's, that's a fascinating yeah. question. That's a it's a lot easier on the console to prevent that kind of thing than it is PC, since PC is inherently kind of like open sourced. Uh, you can do a lot of different things. You can um, basically, I mean, you have your own computer there, but a console is sort of closed in the sense that there's not gonna be many people that know like the source code of how to like hack or like operate the machinery on that. So that's something most of our users are console users. Um, we have a growing PC base, but PC is really the main concern with hackers and people that kind of abuse um, all the time. But it does occur on console, so that's something that we keep in con constant contact with Sony and Microsoft on. Well, Matt, I got to tell you, one, very thankful you came up. Love that you're from Florida State, and I would hope Absolutely. someone in the crowd here that's getting ready to graduate that three to five years from now, they're going to be back at the summit down the road talking about right. analytics, gaming, whatever their passion is. But um, let's give Matt a round of applause.